All right, stats friends, we're back. So we're kind of in the middle of chapter six, which this actually is the end of our first semester. Sorry for my misspeaking. Uh, chapter five, I thought was the end. Turns out, no. Uh, so here in this section, we're going to be transforming and also combining random variables. So I thought this was a pretty cool lesson because, you know, I love my algebra. So anytime algebra and stats want to want to make have a party then that makes me happy basically <laughs> all right so a few learning targets today let's get into them so in chapter two we talked about how um, we could perform linear transformations on the shape center and variability of our distributions so a couple of things to recall from that chapter and if probably doesn't feel like it was that long ago. So if you are adding and then also subtracting because they're really the same thing a constant a to every observation, that's going to add or subsequently subtract a to each of the measures of center and location so all of the data points are going to be added to that uh, with that a and all of the uh, measures of center median mean are going to be added by a or subtracted uh, the variability does not change in any way and then the shape and any measure of variability is going to stay the same um so <clears throat> Big point here, does not change the shape of the distribution. Okay, that's a weird slide. I don't know what just happened. Okay, <laughs> I don't know what happened to my transitioning there. Let's come back to this. Multiplying or dividing each observation by a positive constant B. So now we're looking at multiplying by a constant. We know multiplying and dividing are the same idea in math, so either one. It is going to multiply the location of the center by B. So same here with adding mean x well I say mean because we're gonna talk about mean a lot today but the measure of center kind of does exactly what you think it's gonna do so that's that's pretty nice and I think in your book the authors call it playing nice the mean plays nice so the multiply the spread is gonna be multiplied by that factor of B it won't shape the change of the distribution so it will affect the measure of variability and the spread but the actual shape is going to look the same so as far as the skewedness is it normally distributed or I should say is it symmetrical so that was back in chapter two so now let's look at an old example that we've been working with in this chapter about Pete and his Jeep tours so he has that day trip in that tourist area and let's see represent the total amount of money that Pete collects on a randomly selected trip so we've seen this distribution before this probability distribution we've worked with it back in uh, the previous section for this chapter so that looks familiar huh so what if Pete has to um, spend hundred dollars to buy permits gas and a ferry pass every time he takes some people on a day trip so what's going to happen is this distribution is going to be affected because his profits are going to be you know taken down by a hundred dollars so let v equal the amount of profit that pete collects on the trip so even though he's taking in money we know that's not always his profit so if i kind of go back real quick look at the original one notice at that first um value of c it was 300 and now on our new distribution there we go <laughs> starting off at 200 so he's affected everything by hundred dollars so side by side these distributions the shape looks the same right so we have this new value of profit defined as C minus hundred so we kind of think about how did that transformation affect all of the other things that we know about this distribution so the mean uh, of this new distribution is 462.50, which is exactly $100 less than the original mean of the original distribution. So just like we anticipated, the mean is affected by that adding or subtracting of the constant. The standard deviation, however, is exactly the same in both distributions. And then the shape, if you kind of squint and like step back, the shape is the same. So it has this symmetrical distribution with a single peak. Notice the single peak is at a different location, but the shape itself is the same. So just to kind of recap here, adding A uh, means that you add A to the measure of center, and that would affect all of the measures and location numbers, although we only looked at mean in that example. It did not change the measure of variability, and the shape was also the same. So that's kind of a recap of what we already kind of knew from Chapter 2, but it works for probability distributions as well. All right. Let's look at this other example in a large introductory statistics class. The score X of a randomly selected student on a test is worth 50 points and can be modeled by a normal distribution with mean of 35 and a standard deviation of five. 
Due to a difficult question on the test, the professor decides to add five points to each student's score. So we call that a gift, huh? Just everybody gets five points. Let Y be the scaled test score of the randomly selected student. Describe the shape, center, and variability of the probability distribution of Y, so the new one. So what we do to find the center for Y is we take the original mean of X and we just have that same constant factor of add five. So the new mean for our new distribution is 40. However, the variability does not change. It's still going to be a variability of five scores, uh, five points. The standard deviation is how we measured variability there. All right, so now what happens if we multiply or subsequently divide by a random variable B? So mean plays nice. It's going to multiply those uh, measures of center and location by B as well. And it's also this time going to uh, multiply the measure of variability by B. However, the shape will not change. So the shape is going to stay the same. If you squint, that's how I look at it. If I squint and step back, it looks the same. Uh, multiplying or dividing by a constant has the same effect uh, of a probability distribution as it did for random variables, uh, of random variables as it did for the distribution of quantitative data back in chapter two. So I love in math when things can kind of connect, and that happens a lot in math. You know, we humans designed it that way. All right, let's look at this example. I'm not sure that we've seen this one yet. Eh, maybe, maybe not. My, my memory's lapsing. We have El Dorado Community College considers a student to be full-time if he or she is taking between 12 and 18 credit units. The number of units X is randomly selected, blah, 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 full-time student, <laughs> is uh, on this following distribution. So these are all their full-time students, anywhere from 12 to 18 credit hours, and then the probability within their um, distribution for each of those. At the right, we have a, a distribution. The mean is 14.65 and the standard deviation is 2.056. So obviously we would have used a calculator to find all that. Do, do, do. Um, the tuition for a full-time student is $50 per unit. If that uh, That is, if T equals tuition charge for a randomly selected student, then this is the mathematical setup for how to find t, 50 times x. So that makes sense. Your college would charge you per credit hour. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're multiplying by the number 50. So we try to think about how does that affect everything? Well, the shape is going to be the same. So here what you see is, um, well, apparently you see all the answers. That's nice. Uh, so the shape is going to be the same. It's going to have... <laughs> They're calling this roughly symmetric. I mean, it, it is, but there's three peaks, right? Peak, peak, peak. And that is not going to change when we do the multiply by 50 either. The, the new histogram for uh, T is not shown here, and they didn't ask us to show it, so that's okay. The center, the, the mean of T, is going to be found by just simply multiplying the mean of X by 50. So the mean... Um, Tuition costs for our students would be $732.50. Huh, that is cheap. My goodness. Rock Valley is a lot more than that. It's like more than double that. I don't know. Is this a real college? All right. The variability, we know when we multiply by a factor, it's going to multiply the standard deviation or any measure of variability by that same factor. So um, the standard deviation for T is $102.80. Okay, so now it's time to check our understanding. We have this probability distribution for, what do we have here? Sales of an auto dealer. So X represents the number of cars sold during the first hour on any selected Friday. So based on previous records, here's your distribution. So this is the distribution of X. They give you the mean and the standard deviation. And then it says, suppose the dealer's manager receives a $500 bonus from the company for each car sold. So let Y represent the bonus received from car sales during the first hour on a randomly selected Friday. So first question they're going to want you to do is sketch the distribution of this original one um, and then sketch a new one for Y. So what you want to determine first is like kind of the algebra. You know, what are we doing with that 500? Are we adding a 500? Are we multiplying by a 500? What's going on? So give a sketch, find the mean of y, which you actually could do really easily by hand, um, because remember, it's going to be an expected value question, but you could use calculator, of course. And then we're going to calculate and interpret the standard deviation of y. Oop, oop, 
Oop, oop, back, back, back. <laughs> I was showing the answers. I was trying to lower this. There we go. There. Um, the manager sp spends $75 to provide coffee and donuts to prospective customers each morning, so the manager's net profit T during the first hour is $75 less than the bonus earned. So now they want you to, to figure out shape center variability of this new distribution of T and how that spending $75 for donuts affects everything. All right, pause the video, take a look, write down some answers, and let's see how you did. Okay, now, so here, obviously generated from a computer, thank you technology, this is our original distribution, and this is the new distribution when they have those bonuses. So what you're going to notice, and I don't think they, oh, up in the next screen, they'll show it, but they multiply the, the distribution by 500 because every car sold is going to give them a bonus. So that's a multiplication factor. So for the second question, the mean of our new distribution is going to be 500 times the original distribution's mean. So an, a mean of $550. The standard deviation is affected the same way where we multiplied the original standard deviation by 500. And then we had to interpret it. So textbook answer, if, again, we got that many, many thing, right? Probability distributions are only applied when you have many, 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 um, you know, uh, randomly selected things, you know, whatever you're working with. So and in this case, many, many Fridays are randomly selected. The bonus earned in the first hour of business will typically vary by $471.50 away from the mean of $550. So there's that context with both the variability and the measure of center. So then that fourth question about the nice boss who buys him donuts, uh, that's just simply subtracting 75 off of this new distribution that we found. So they're taking that money and we're going to subtract 75. And remember, this money was going to the boss, right? It was the manager or something who got all the, oh yeah, good for him. All right. <laughs> so the shape is going to be exactly the same as all the other distributions. So notice they were skewed to the right. And when we didn't graph T, but it would be the same, also skewed to the right. Oops, wrong way. Um, with a single peak, yes. Uh, the mean for T would be if we took the mean for Y and subtracted 75, because that's what is affected when you add or subtract numbers to distributions. But the standard deviation is going to be the same as it was for Y. No, no, so no change on the variability. Now, I don't think they wanted to uh, interpret this one, so I'm just going to move along. Okay. Um, I think. This might be the end of day one. Those of you who are looking for it, if you have a question, just email me and I'll let you know. I'll probably put it in our plans. I'm kind of like, this is, I'm recording this in August and I'm planning for December. So who knows what's going to happen between now and December. Guys, it's, this has been a strange couple of years. You know that. Okay, so let's talk about a linear transformation of the random variable. So we're going to go back to our um, slope intercept form that we've been working with a lot this year, y equals a plus bx, where a is the y intercept and b is the slope for stats. And capital X here represents the random variable x from our probability distributions. Well, think of this as taking a distribution and you're multiplying x by a value of b, but you're also adding an a. So I kind of think of this as a combination of both of those things we've been talking about. It's got an added factor of a, and it's got a multiplier of whatever b is. So the probability distribution of this new y is going to have the same shape, right, um, if b is greater than 0. The mean is just going to be affected by both of those things. So it's going to have a multiplier of b, to the original distribution's mean, and it's going to add an A. The standard deviation, however, the A is not going to affect the standard deviation, but the B will because it's a multiplier. And then they do want to caution you to put absolute value bars around the B because we know slope value you know, could be negative. We don't want to incorporate a negative number into our, our variability calculation. So take the positive version of that if, if necessary. And that gets multiplied by the original uh, distribution standard deviation. So this can apply to discrete and continuous. Good news. <laughs> so back to our Jeep tours problem. So was it Jeff? What was his name? I don't know. Pete. Pete, of course. All right. Sorry, Pete. Uh, so Pete has his program, you know, going on where he's running these Jeep tours. But he's got a sister, Erin, if you remember. I think we've talked about this before. She also runs Jeep tours, but she's on the other side of the country. Man, family business and all. 
So let Y represent everything with Aaron's company. I wonder if she's better. I don't know. Maybe not. Probably. I don't know. We'd have to do the calculations. I don't know. I'm Aaron, so I kind of feel like Aaron should win in this. I don't know if they're having a competition. I just made this weird. All right, so here's her dis distribution of her, um, her probability distribution. So the first question is, what is the sum X plus Y, so Pete plus Aaron, if the number of passengers Pete and Aaron will have on their tours is randomly selected uh, on a randomly selected day? So what's going to happen if we just add their distributions together? I don't know why they would do this. I mean, these are grown people. Why would you add your company's stuff together? I guess you're a very nice family. All right. And what is the difference X minus Y? Now notice we do have to watch who's X and who's Y. So it was Pete minus Aaron. Um, and the number of passengers Pete and Aaron will have on a randomly selected day. So you might have some gut instincts as to whether you like what you think will happen, but let's see if they play out. So the mean or the expected value for our random variables, if we wanted to add them together, yep, you literally just add them together. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And then for difference, yep, exactly probably what you were thinking. You just subtract them. But keep in mind you have to go in the correct difference order. And then also if you're writing an answer in context, you have to notify like your reader in what order did you subtract them. So in our case, if we are writing about this question at the end, we'd have to say, you know, the difference in the means Pete minus Aaron. So we got to keep keep uh, track of that. Now, the fact that they went Pete minus Aaron is kind of telling me that Pete is higher number, but I don't know. We'll see. All right. Pete charges $150 per passenger and Aaron charges $175 per passenger for a Jeep tour. Oops, I'm sorry, guys. Phone's going off. Let C be the amount of money that Pete collects and E is the amount of money that Aaron collects. They didn't want to use P because that's confusing. On a randomly selected day, from our earlier work, we know that the mean of Pete is 562.50. And then we could quickly figure out that Aaron's mean or expected value is 542.50. I knew it. Darn it, Aaron. Work harder. Okay. <laughs> so define C plus E, calculate and interpret the mean. So easy. We just add the expected values together. So we get um, uh, an expected value. S is $1,105. So the interpretation of that is Pete and Aaron expect to collect a total of $1,105 per day on average over many, many, many randomly selected days. Remember, we've got to mention that many, many, many stuff. They didn't put too many many's in that answer. I think they could use another one. All right. So I think now they're going to prove to you that this is true. So the total number of passengers who go on Pete and Aaron's tours is defined as S. So um, they're going to say that if these are independent, then we can figure this out. Um, remember, pr using X does not help us predict Y. I think it's safe for us to assume that because they're on opposite sides of the country, they have nothing to do with each other. So it'd be a little different if they worked in the same town, you know. If I had to choose whether I went to Aaron or Pete's company, but they are completely away from each other. So because they're independent, that means we can go back and look at our probability formula for independent events. The probability of A and B is simply equal to probability of A times probability of B. So for us, um, the question specifically said five passengers, right? I think I kind of skipped over that at some point because I don't read so hot. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know when they said five. Where did the five come from? It's probably in our book and I didn't take a picture of that. I'm sorry. Anyways, they say there's two ways for us to get a total of five passengers on a randomly selected day. It could be, you know, Pete gets three, Aaron gets two, or vice versa. Pete has two, Aaron has three. It Four and one is not an option, remember, because there was a weird rule in this problem where, like, you had to have at least two passengers in your vehicle. Otherwise, they wouldn't run the trip. I remember that being a weird, I mean, it makes sense, but yeah. Why would you go on a Jeep trip by yourself? All right, anywho, because we know these are independent events, we simply multiply them together. So if I backtrack real quick, uh, get it back to there. If I took, you know, Pete three and Aaron two, and I multiplied them together, <laughs> too much transitioning. Um, and then also the other one, two and three, I think they're in the other order, but that's okay. And then I added those together, that gives us the answer that we are looking for. 
which is exactly the answer you get on the probability distribution if you were to add those two probability distributions together. So basically the last couple slides here has just been your book proving to you that yes, you can indeed just simply add them together. So if you didn't believe me, maybe you believe me now. All right, well, let's talk about standard deviation. So how does standard deviation play with these um, transformations? When we, when we add or subtract transformations. Same problem. Now this time we have our new distribution of when we combine Pete and Aaron together, because remember this was a, what do they call it? X plus Y distribution. So we have a variation that's standard deviation squared over here, and then a standard deviation of this new distribution. So how are these all related to each other? And, you know, we could sit there in class and kind of figure out like, oh, how would you get from one number to another? Because they're clearly not the same. And then for most kids, what they end up doing is they try adding them together because remember, that's what we're doing. And they're like, well, that didn't work. So this kind of is violating all of our rules about what we had been talking about were standard deviation where like they either stayed the same or they got multiplied by a number. Well, this is different because remember here we're adding the d the distributions together. So rather than making you suffer, I'm just going to tell you. You actually cannot add deviations together. What you have to do is work with their variances. So to get a standard deviation of a sum of two random variables, if you're trying to add and we'll learn them and also subtract two distributions together. What you have to do is add their variances together and then square root it. So you have to go back a step and say, okay, a variance to variance measurements can be added together, but then to kind of come back to the right units, you got to square root it at the end. Leave it to standard deviation to be weird, huh? All right, when we add two independent random variables, their variances add. Standard deviations do not add. Somehow we got to get that in our heads. All right, now to make matters worse, what if we subtract? So most common sense, for most kids, their common sense kicks in and says, well, I bet we subtract their variances and then square root them. Well, that's not going to mathematically work out. If you did this minus, oops, not that. If you did this minus this and then you square rooted it, you're not going to get this number. Turns out, you actually do the same thing you did for adding. And I know that kind of blows your mind because you're like, what? <laughs> Remember what variance of standard deviation are measuring? It's the typical distance from the mean. Um, and because we're like taking the signage away from it, distance is like considered always positive. So that's why I kind of wrap my brain around measurements for standard deviation of like adding, 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 always adding. So just to make your life worse, when we subtract two independent random variables, their variances actually add. Now I'm going to look at this as a positive. To me, this is less for me to memorize. I know that standard deviations and variances for these variable uh, distributions, when I add them or subtract them, at least one of the formulas is exactly the same. Not that the other one's that hard, but you know. All right, so what do we have here? We got Aaron and Pete again. Blah, blah, blah. We know what their uh, standard deviations were from our previous work. So now what they want to know is you may assume that these two random variables are independent. Define D equals C minus E. So this is Pete minus Aaron. Earlier we found the mean. Now they'd like to calculate the standard deviation and also interpret it. So we're going to use our formula where we first find the variance of D. So we add the variances together. Even though we're subtracting, we have to add them because yeah, they're welcome to math. Um, but we kind of talked about that. It's measuring distance, so it's always positive. Then we square them. Uh, well, sorry, they were squared because it's variance. And then we add them together and then we square root them. And that brings us back to just the single unit for standard deviation. So now to interpret it, the difference, and then remember we have to notate which way, Pete minus Aaron, in the amount collected on a randomly selected day typically varies by $232.28 from the mean difference of $20. They didn't do that over many, many select randomly selected days thing, but you know, it's okay. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at our, check your understanding. I got that car dealership again, where that boss is getting a bunch of bonuses. Good for him. All right, so what's going on here this time? We got X, we got Y. Um, oh, it's a different distribution. Never mind. 
X represents the number of cars sold and Y is the number of cars leased during the first hour of business on a randomly selected Friday. Uh, with you guys being kind of new to the driving world, you might not know what a lease is. A, a lease is basically like, it's almost like a rent to own program for a car, but you're renting it and you're paying like a monthly payment and you can sell it off at some point. Okay, anyways, it's not important. Uh, based on the previous records, they've already calculated some stuff for you. So they got the mean of distribution X and standard deviation as well as for Y. So they said, let's define this new distribution T um, where you just simply add X plus Y. And they do mention to us that these are independent events. Well, we're assuming they're independent. So find and interpret the mean of T, the expected value for T. And then you're going to calculate and interpret the standard deviation for T. And then they have a follow-up question where the manager is getting a $500 bonus for each car sold and a $300 bonus for each car leased. Find the mean and the standard deviation for the total bonus, and they're going to want you to call that B. So pause the video and jot down some thoughts. I think you got one and two pretty easy. Three might be a little bit of a challenge, so give it some time. All right, so first, the mean. Expected value, easy peasy. You add them together, you add them together. So the expected value is 1.8. So to interpret that, there's that many, many. If many, many Fridays are randomly selected, this dealership expects to sell or lease about 1.8 cars on average in the first business hour. Oh, it was these. Oh, I'm so sorry. I hope that didn't blast your eardrums. Okay. Because X and Y are independent, now they're going to ask us to find the de standard deviation of the new distribution. But remember, we can't find the standard deviation by just adding them together. We have to work with the variances. So they took their variances, which remember, all they gave us was standard deviation. So we had to go and square them to find variance. So deviation squared is variance. We add them up. But then remember, that's still squared. So that we have to come through and square root it. So you get a 1.14 for a standard deviation of T. So to interpret that, if many, many Fridays are randomly selected, the total number of cars sold or leased in the first hour will typically vary by 1.14 cars from the mean of 1.8 cars. Okay. I, you know, we really need that template written down somewhere in our notes about how we answer these questions because that does get tricky. The total bonus. All right, so this is where they're talking about the the manager getting a $500 bonus for the cars that are sold. And then the, now that they have this other distribution for leases, he gets a $300 bonus for each lease. So notice this new distribution has multipliers in front of each distribution, and then they're adding them together. So if I think about mean, that just kind of behaves exactly how I think it would. You take the original mean for X and you multiply it by 500. You take the original mean for Y and you multiply it by 300. And then you just add them together because we're adding these together. So thank you, Algebra and Stats, for, for being similar. But then it gets weird when we go to standard deviation. And remember, they are independent, so we're allowed to do this calculation. We have to find the variances and remember, variances, standard deviation, any variability is still affected by the multipliers. So this is where it gets a little confusing because order of operations, right? It makes a difference. You're going to have to multiply the standard deviation of x by 500 and then square it to get his variance. Multiply the standard deviation of y by 300 and then square it to get his variance. We add them up. And we have to remember that this is still units squared. So then we square root. Now, the great thing about doing applied mathematics, like statistics is, if you left your answer as $259,176, that means you're going to tell me that the car, uh, the, uh, where are we at? The bonus, the typical bonus on a given Friday, the first hour of any given Friday for this guy is $300,000, almost. Like, I hope to you that makes no sense at all. Like, that's crazy. And if that's how much they get paid, then I'm going to go switch jobs. This makes more sense. So in any uh, one of our randomly selected Fridays, $509.09 is, um, well, excuse me, his typical bonus is $760, and it varies by $509.09. That would make a lot more sense. If, so read, girl. All right, combining normal random variables. So far, we have concentrated... Uh, this for sure, by the way, is day two. I'm not sure if we've already hit day two, but for sure this is day two. So far we've concentrated on um, means and variances for random variables, but what if we have normal 
normal random variables. So any sum or difference of independent normal random variables is also normally distributed. Okay. The mean and standard deviation of the resulting normal distribution can be found using the appropriate rules for mean and standard deviation. So this is again where we're going to kind of tap into our knowledge from a previous chapter and say like, okay, thanks math for kind of following along with what I thought would be true. This is a cool question that's in your book. I use, I, I think the adjective cool is probably a stretch. It's cool for me as your teacher. All right, the diameter C of the top of a randomly selected large drink cup at a fast food restaurant follows a normal distribution with mean of 3.96 inches and a standard deviation of 0.01 inch. Cool. That makes a lot of sense because like, have you ever had a plastic lid that didn't fit the cup? It is very frustrating. So the standard deviation better be real small. The diameter L of a randomly selected large lid at this restaurant follows a normal distribution of 3.98 inches and a standard deviation of 0.02 inches. Assume that L and C are independent random variables. Let the random variable D equal L minus C, and that's the difference between the lid's diameter and the cup's diameter. Okay, cool. <laughs> Let's describe the distribution of D. So the shape is not gonna change, right? We subtracted the distributions, but that does not change the shape. The center is going to be defined as the subtraction of the two centers. And they wanted you to do L minus C, so you got to stick with that order. So 3.98 minus 3.96, so their center is 0 0.02 inch for this new distribution of difference. And then the variability, the standard deviation, is found by uh, adding the variances together. So standard deviation squared plus standard deviation squared, and then square rooting that. Now, if this was an AP question, you would have to show all that calculation. So we got to make sure that we know how to use these formulas. So standard deviation for this um, difference distribution is 0 0.0224 inch. So question B says, for a lid to fit on a cup, the value L has to be bigger than the value C. Okay, that makes sense. Lid has to be bigger than the cup, but not by more than 0 0.06 inches. So again, I've had the situation where it wasn't just miss like a weird form, but like it literally didn't fit the cup. So there's a, a certain threshold where they will uh, say they have a good product and they, they can have a little bit of wiggle room. Find the probability that a randomly selected lid will fit on a randomly selected cup. So what they've done here is because we have this normal distribution idea now is they found the area between um, and it's, <laughs> this is cute. All right, so if you remember, we already calculated the mean and standard deviation in the previous question. So here's your mean and here's your standard deviation. So they've done a beautiful job of sketching a normal curve, labeling the mean, counting out distributions, and then notice where their marks are. Zero, meaning no difference, up to 0 0.06. And we're supposed to find the area between here. Now remember, this is where we can kind of have a little bit of liberty. Do you want to use z-scores in table A? Go for it. You know Mrs. Abruzzo is probably not going to do this. Um, I'm going to use my technology, and I'm going to say, now I'm going to be honest, for Mrs. Abruzzo, because she's so lazy, I didn't standardize mine. I would have gone 0, 0, 0.06, comma, 0, 0.02, comma, I forgot the other one, uh, 0, 0.0224. But remember, on an AP test, you have to still label lower, upper, mean, standard deviation, even if you're using your calculator. You can't just write calculator speak. It, it's not going to accept that. Either way, guys, you're going to get a probability of about 0.7767-ish. Oh, see? Right there. I should have been more patient. All right. This is the Abruzzo method. Just, I'm, I love my calculator so much. I never want to get rid of it. I have one on my phone, I have one in my purse. I just love calculators. Nothing wrong with using the table though. All right, oh, by the way, about using the table, I didn't really cover that. They found the z-scores for 0 and 0.6, and then they used their table, remembering that um, the z-score for this guy over here, 1.79 z-score, measures all the way to the left, and then the z-score here for negative 0.89 measures all the way to the left. So to find the area between them, they subtracted them. So they got a very comparable answer using the table. Good old fashioned table. Now let's interpret that. 
there is a 77.7% chance that a randomly selected lid will fit on a randomly selected cup. Again, they probably should have said something like, if many, many, many were selected. Oh, Abruzzo, day two started a long time ago, girl. That was the end of the lesson. My goodness. I hope you didn't have to sit through that whole lesson accidentally. And you know what, guys? If you were just looking for day one, you just watched the whole lesson for day two as well. So you're ahead of the game. You can help us during class tomorrow. I apologize. All right, everybody. I have fantastic news. There is one, one more lesson coming up after this. Less fantastic news. The next lesson is a big one. Like it's going to take us four or five days, like for the lesson. So <sighs> got to kill your spirit somehow, kids. Sorry. Right at the end of December or middle of December. All right. Bye.